It's 7.30, it's time for Cinematic Conversations. Uh, I'm Bart Weiss and tonight we have, um, well, you guys, you've all seen the film, right? You know, not up and down, like I'm a teacher, this is what I do. <laughs> was this not a fucking incredible movie? I mean, it was really good. So Sam made this film and uh, it played at Sundance. It played at many places other than Sundance. It's on Netflix, which is just really, I mean, it's incredible that Netflix is running this. I mean, it really is. And I think that's a testament to the uh, power um, of the film. So before we get into this film, um, Sam, since I just don't know much about you other than that you made this great film, um, what did you go to film school? How did you sort of get involved in making films? You know, I, let's see, I did photography when I was young and a teenager growing up in New York in Brooklyn. And I, the photo, I was telling photo essays and they're very much reflecting how I was becoming politicized uh, in the late eighties and early nineties. Um, and then when I got to college, didn't work out well with the teacher at my college. And he was the only teacher who was teaching photography. He was um, really inappropriate with students. So I stopped doing photography for a while. And then um, after college, I was traveling around and I kind of switched my focus again back to wanting to tell visual stories, you know, in a political way. And I started making films. And that's what, so I was about, I don't know, about 20 years ago. Really? 20 years? Looking, yeah, 20 so years ago. So is there a film that you saw and you said, you know, I could do this. There, there's yeah. something here that look like can make a difference. Yeah. What was that? You Talk know, so when that. I was, when I, when I left for photography in college, I started doing sculpture, um, which has some, has a lot of relationship to filmmaking actually. But so that's what I was doing for a few years. And at one point I moved to Mexico and I was studying with different sculptors in Mexico. And one night I went to see a movie uh, at a university in that town I was in. And I went to see all about my mother by Pedro Moldovar. And it was that movie that when I walked out, I just, it just rocked my world the way you could tell such a politically impactful movie in such a beautiful way. And so, and, and the, the issues he was dealing with at that time were issues that I was dealing with in my work. So seeing this opportunity to deal with these like marginalized issues, right? This issues that mainstream society doesn't want to look at or talk about and do it in this way that could reach such a mass audience in a visceral way. I was just, that was it. That's when I decided to turn back. And but, but also it, it just, you know, marries an artistic vision with politics. Yeah. Which oftentimes films are like strong one way and not so strong the other way, but, you know, kind of interesting. But that's like a work that kind of can spark that. So tell me about your first film. What, what, what was your first film experience? When I, the first film that I made? Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, the first film I made looks like a first film someone would make. <laughs> that was in 2003, I started it. Uh -huh. And I was in grad school at the time for media theory, media studies. And but there where weren't was really that? I was at the new school in New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. And, yeah. And, uh, and it was an MA program. It wasn't an MFA program. So there was, wasn't much production but I knew I wanted to make films. So I just you know, asked a friend if she wanted to make a film with me. And at that time, you know, what was happening in the New York queer scene was we were seeing a, a large um, emergence of trans men. And the film looks at that emergence at that time in New York City. And there was a lot of backlash within the queer community saying that these guys were taking the easy way out. They just didn't want to be masculine women. And that, that just felt really amiss. And I wanted to kind of have a container for that conversation. So that first film looks at these, you know, follows these three guys through a, a stage of their transition and talking to people in the community about this, this sort of inner fight that we were seeing at the time and putting that in historical context. So that was called Boy I Am, but it's very, it definitely looks like a first film. <laughs> so I always feel like I have to give that disclaimer. Um, but my second film I'm, I'm more proud of, um, is called Kate Bornstein is a Queer and Pleasant Danger. And it's a profile of the gender activist, author, theorist, um, performance artist, Kate Bornstein, who lives in New York. She's in her mid seventies now, and she's a real pioneer in, in transgender visibility and art. And um, that was a much more lyrical look at her life um, 
as an artist. And that was after you were in school? Yeah, that came out, that I started in 20, that when I went to get an MFA at Hunter College, oh. um, I made that film and that came out in 2014. Um, and in that first film, did you actually film the transition? Unfortunately, I did. And I learned, uh, you know, at that time, and by the time I was done, I was really, I had really changed my mind about how these stories should be told. But, you know, there were only a handful of films made about trans guys before them, and that's what they all did. And that's how I taught myself how to make a film, right? I watched other people's work. And it just, you know, immediately after, as I'm watching it in audiences, I could just feel myself feeling really uncomfortable. And yes, there's pretty much everything I'm, every decision I made about making that film are things I'm deeply critical about now. And I, I'm very honest about that, very transparent about that. And um, have written about it, um, but that was, you know, 17 years ago. So people really shouldn't be doing those things anymore. And and at that point, you you didn't know you were just doing what you thought was doing by the work that you had seen and people what people were doing. Yeah. So yeah. you can't beat yourself up for that. I mean, I don't beat myself up over it. You know, thank you. I appreciate that. You're very much a teacher right now. I appreciate that. But I think also you know, the lens of myself being a filmmaker, I think is very different than someone who's not trans. And for me, you know, I was looking for answers. Like, I think all my films are about a very personal question I have, and this is how I explore them. And so I was deeply curious about this experience and, and, and I wanted to see it, but I think it's what a trans person looking at these very intimate issues is very different than a non-trans person. Looking. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the questions that um, trans people say you shouldn't ask us it's very different when a trans person asks us than when a non-trans person asks us. So yes. you know, that being said, you know, that's, it's, it's different framing, um, but it's not for mainstream consumption, I don't think. And, and so, so let's get to, to, to the current film. So, so yeah. um, when did you decide, I mean, I'm, it's very clear to me that these are issues that are very important to you and everything that's in here are things you've thought about and have been thinking about for a long time. When did you decide that like, it's time to do this, let's just kind of get it done, let's, let's move forward? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I have been thinking about doing this film for a very long time. I mean, um, one film that really changed my relationship to the media was Ethnic Notions, which I'm sure you're familiar with by Marlon Riggs, right? Marlon it looks Riggs, at the one, of, one of my heroes. Same, same. I, I, and, I did a film about Marlon and I have one of the very yeah. last interviews with him. Cause you know, he, oh. uh, his mother was living in Fort Worth and uh, he came to visit his mother to do some shooting for uh, Black is Black Ain't. And I got oh, this wow. incredibly beautiful interview with him. But yes, oh, I would love to see it. I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, but yes, uh, Ethnic Notions is uh, Marlon Riggs, this African American filmmaker who probably his most famous work is Tongues Untied, which is about being African American and gay. But it's done in a very sort of experimental documentary way. Ethnic Notions, which you made before that, was about how popular culture images have been framed of African Americans and what that meant to their life. And it was also done in a very beautiful way, but somewhat less experimental than Tongues Untied was. But anyway, go yeah, on. Yeah, it was super conventional in its in its format, but still radical in its content. And yes. you know, he followed that up with color adjustment, which yes. looked at representations of black people on television. So it's really, really, it's a really um, can, can he cohesive now. It's it's a very robust. Um, look at, at the representation of media, you know, and, and I was so struck by ethnic notions because it's really a history of America, right? It really tells you what was happening in our country, you know, when these images are being made. Um, you know, so I just was constantly thinking about what would this look like? You know, what is, what would it look like looking at this history of trans people? What would that tell us about the evolution of these images? And what would it tell us about society? Um, and what would it tell us about our country and our history? And so, I had been thinking about it for a long time. I taught earlier in my, you know, in the, in my career, and I, you know, often would make little shorts about this issue for my students. But I didn't think it was something I would take on as a project like Disclosure. But fast forward to 2014, and trans visibility was increasing, and mainstream society was talking about us in ways I had never heard before. 
And there were two things that were really disconcerting to me about how the media was insinuating that visibility in itself is the goal for a trans movement. And also that trans people were somehow something new. And so I felt compelled to give trans and non-trans people more context, right? To understand these changes in our culture, to have a better sense of the history and how we got to this point of visibility, all while foregrounding the fact that visibility in itself is not the goal, right? It's a means to an end. And visibility in itself is often really problematic, right? So the paradox of visibility is something we really, you know, go back that's attention throughout disclosure the whole time. And it's, um, so I felt it's done yeah. very well in the film, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so, so you aesthetically sort of have a sense that this needs to be done. Politically, have a sense this need to be done. Yeah. How do you start to do pre-production for this and go out and raise money? Of course, this is not an inexpensive project and get connections to the key people that you need to make this work. So fun talking to other filmmakers about this because you ask the really fun questions. This is the stuff I love to get into. Um, so, you know, when I first it was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I thought I was going to look at all media, right? I was going to look at indie. I was going to look at international. I was going to look at print. You know, I really wanted to see it all. And, but I also knew that if I was going to tell this history, if I was going to, you know, dare to document a history on behalf of an enormous population, um, I couldn't do it in a vacuum. I mean, telling a history is so ethically precarious anyway. And so I wanted to do as much as I could to, to be as inclusive, you know, in this research process. So the first thing I did was I made a list of every trans person I knew or wanted to know who has worked on one side of the counter or the other. Mm. And I had saved up, I don't know, like $10,000 from my last film. I quit teaching and I went on the road and I started interviewing just with my, you know, backpack of my camera and my light kit and, you know, just in the mic and just did these, you know, really not for the public view, but filmed these research interviews with, I don't know, I think it ended up being like around 70 people across mm. the country. And it was during that process that I, when people just kept talking about Hollywood, kept talking about mainstream images. And I was, you know, at first I was frustrated because I was like, that's not the story I want to tell. Our story is much more interesting than just limiting it to this one lens. And, in, and also I, I looked away from mainstream media in the late nineties. I stopped looking because I, there was, I couldn't really get through much of anything without feeling really offended. You know, and I, I started looking at indie work, which I found much more inspiring and expansive. But after I did these, interviews, I realized that the history really is in the overlap of these Hollywood images, the dominant images, the mainstream images. And so then I started collecting the data. And there was no book on the topic. Both ethnic notions and celluloid closet that are sort of the staple of this genre are based on books. There was no book on this topic. So I had to start collecting the data from, but I wanted it to start from these interviews. And it was only trans people, as I said before. So the nexus, the heart, of this film is through the memories and experience of trans people. And that's how I collected the information. That's great. And then you went out and tried to raise some money. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a, you know, from beginning, from, from fundraising to distribution, if I had a dollar for every time someone told me they already have a trans film, like that would pay for the film in itself. Right. People think you only need one trans film to fund. You only need one trans film to distribute or, right, we, you know, we they did that. We're good. We did that. <laughs> it's done. And even people said they already had something like this, which doesn't, it's not true. <laughs> so it was so frustrating. Um, and so, you know, I would say 75% of my, you know, producing energy was towards fundraising. And I mean, we did everything from house parties to grants, you know, to, um, going to larger organizations like Good Pitch, um, oh, which good is that. Pitch is a great thing. So for those who great. Know, a good Pitch is um, some foundations got together and they have these things around the country. We had one in Dallas a few years ago and people get to pitch in front of funders really interesting projects and things get done out of that, which is just really incredible. Anyway, um, so, so you're starting to raise money. That's really good. You've got all of these interviews you did by yourself, which is really wonderful. And what's really great about this methodology is that in doing this, you already create a connection between you and all of your interviewees because you had this moment 
and a moment with you and them is very different than a moment with a whole bunch of people walking around getting things together. So that meant that the interviews you got had something special to them, which I think is really great. And not enough people who make documentaries do these like pre-interviews that I think are just incredibly valuable. And it also meant that you knew what they were going to say and you knew how to get to that. So I think that's like totally brilliant. So talk to me about setting the light and setting that room and creating that environment. Because if you're doing everything and it's one look, I'm sure you spent a lot of time thinking about that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, a confluence of, you know, it's a budgeting issue, a scheduling issue, but more so it was an aesthetic issue because I knew we were gonna be using all this material, all this archival material, which was going to be so diverse in terms of like the color palette to the aspect ratio to just the quality of, of the, the film. Um, so I, I felt that we needed to have a really serene, elegant setting for the interviews. And I wanted the participants, the cast members to really be foregrounded in this setting. And I, so it's, you know, the background is all white on white on white, different textures of white. Oh, white. Um, and it's really soft, you know, it's a shallow depth of field. Um, and I feel like it also just gives the viewer this sort of resting place because we're, just, we're seeing all of this material for however long the film is, 102 minutes. And so in this moments where a lot of it is, you know, we really want to be focused on what the person is saying, you know, I felt like this was a really good container for that, for those goals. And I think it worked really well. It was very beautiful. I mean, it goes you. you're right. The, the, the images themselves are so alarming and so powerful that coming back to that sort of neutral gave it kind of a continuity. I think, you know, just really kind of, um, kind of work with the film really well. So some of the things that I really sort of drew me in right away, and I think that the, the, the first misconception that I had was like, there aren't many trans people in film. I, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize there was, and then there was like so much, like so ridiculous much. And I, you know, the images of Psycho. I mean, there are all these things that I just didn't put in my head what you had, what's clearly there and was not sort of pointed out to me. Um, and I thought that was that was really important. But I think that the thing that first drew me in to this in a way that's even more profound than say um, a color adjustment or other films that sort of deal with that is, um, and I forgot who it was that was saying this, um, that you know, if you're trans and you live in a small town, you don't know anybody who's trans. So the images you have of who you are are what you see reflected in these images. And if you're African-American or Latino, you see people around because they're there, they're your family, they're images you live with. And I thought that was, that was a, a really profound way in the beginning to open our eyes to look at this in a more powerful way. Yeah, I mean, apparently 80% of the population say they don't think they've ever met a trans person. They probably have, but they just, aren't aware of it. So everything they're learning about trans people is what they're seeing in the media, right? And so like what you're saying, you weren't even aware. Like, so what does that do to our subconscious? Like, what does that do to create our ideologies about the world? And we're taking in these images for decades, right? And then we start to hear that trans people exist. And I, you know, I would never argue that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between representation and violence, but I would argue that when you spend an entire lifetime ingesting these horrible images and then suddenly mainstream shines a light on a marginalized community of course backlash is going to ensue right because all mainstream knows are these horrible horrible tropes and stereotypes which basically just say we don't exist that we're not real and if we are we don't deserve to be part of the public sphere so yeah <laughs> there's a lot and it i think it's it's once you sit through disclosure you're forced to really confront the belief systems that you've carried around, both trans and non-trans people. Like, we're, none of us are free from this. We've all taken in these same images and have been deeply, deeply influenced by them. But I think when you're able to see it outside of yourself, 
there is this cathartic experience, right? For both trans and non-trans people. I think specifically for trans people, seeing these images that you've often experienced in isolation, whether you're with other people or not, but you're experiencing these alone because maybe the people around you just are not, are not gonna understand. When you can see these images and then held by and contextualized by other trans people who are mirroring your experience, I've heard that that's really been able to help people move past them in a way they haven't before. And I think similarly for non-trans people watching this and not, I've heard that people, something that I feel really grateful for is people say that they don't feel shamed, right? They feel, they might feel ashamed of what they hadn't known, but they don't feel like the film is shaming them. And that is really important to me because I don't ever want to demonize or alienate anyone. I just want to have these conversations and grow, right? Have us all grow from them. Yeah. Um, and, and there's so many times when the, the interviewees are not just talking about things, but you mm. see the pain mm. that those images inflected in their voice and in their eye that are just really powerful moments and that you don't tend to see when people are just complaining about the images they saw in, 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 in other kinds of films of this sort of genre. And it's, it's really, really powerful. And, and it is evocative in a way that, that it's, not, it's not intellectual, it's evocative in the way that this film works, which is not an easy thing to do in a film that is kind of an essay but it's a very powerful essay with real human, you know, emotion connected to it. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it's, it, it really, it's such a fine line for me because I'm so against victimizing trans people, right? Watching these stories where we're victimized over and over. And so how do you tell a story about such trauma without victimizing people, like putting them in that pathetic context? And I think, you know, when, people are empowered, right, when they're the experts in their own history, and we're watching with them, right, we're not watching at them, we as an audience are invited into their experience, that's, that's that slight shift we need to be honest about the horrors of the world, but without this sort of victim, perpetrator, pity, pityer dynamic. So Sam, talk to me about, you know, D.W. Griffith, who was, of course, problematic for other reasons, but when did you find out, and, and what is the name of this film? It, 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 it just, it's one of those shocks that I just like, really? Like you go back to the history of film and it's like right there at the beginning. So it's not, not enough that we had racism right at the beginning. We also have this too. Right, these twin fascinations, right? The of race and gender, always, always, you know, intertwined. Um, you know, I got that gem through Susan Stryker, the woman who talks about it in the film. Um, she and I have been friends and have overlapped for many, many years. And at one point she told me that story and it just blew my mind. Um, and it, it affected me on so many levels. On one, one level, yes, the horror, the obvious horror. And then also, but then on the other hand, I was like, also like, oh, that's kind of amazing. We've, we've always been here. We have always been here, right? And we've been a site of fascination forever. So it's like, it's that weird moment of like horror and humiliation and disbelief and anger, but also this validation of, you know, we're constantly told that we don't exist, but here we are, like there we are. Um, and despite the fact that it's done horribly by this person that dare I say is a horrible person, D.W. Griffith, um, it proves that we were in the minds of society. And so therefore we are. You know, there is another thing about the film that I think it happened twice, but it, it, with Paris is Burning particularly, I thought it was really great in that, you know, you start to see it and it's, you know, a great film, wonderful, and you talk about how wonderful it is and to see these people. And then you, you start to turn on the film. And again, this happens again with transgender. It's like, isn't it great that transgender happened? A transparent. Transparent, excuse me, transparent. Sorry, my, my, my bad. All yeah. the puns, all the puns. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but it, 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 it in, in both cases, it's like really fascinating to like suck you in, like, yeah, isn't this great? But, and particularly with Paris is Burning, 
because it really gets into another question, which I think is a very a larger question that people are in documentary are talking a lot about. And that's who's in your film and what are you doing with the people that are in the film? Are you just like coming in, filming them and extracting their material and leaving and going home and then sort of, well, I wouldn't say profiting because there's not much money to be profit off of documentary films, but, but, but for cultural appropriation of other people's lives. So do you want to talk about how, and, and, and the other thing about this is in your credits, you call the interviewees collaborators. Is that right? Is that what it is? Creative consultants. Creative consultants. And that's the first time that I've seen that in a documentary that these people, they're not just saying, these are the people I interviewed here, they are, but creative consultants. And it really changes the dynamic of what you as a director think about your work and the value of the people in the work. And yeah, I've been, I've been uh, to say about that. Yeah, it's, it's, since I started making films, I have always given, I've always given people money. And the first film, it wasn't until we made a small sale that I was able to give anyone money, but it was a no brainer to me. My, the people that participated in it, they have to be paid for their time, right? They are the experts. We pay experts all the time. Why aren't we paying people who are telling their stories, their own stories? Also, when you're, as a filmmaker, when you're telling a story about a marginalized community, often people don't have that many, don't have much access to resources, specifically financial resources. So the time they're giving you is taking away time where they could be working at a job that they're getting paid for. Mm -hmm. Third, as the filmmaker, regardless of what happens, whether there's a success with this film or not, I'm gaining, I'm gaining cultural capital. And so it just, it, it, the, the ethics around that from early on with filmmaking, just I, were really uncomfortable to me that there had to be some reciprocity in this process, people were letting me use their lives for me to create a story. Um, and it's, I'm so glad this is, it's finally becoming more of a conversation in the industry because I, it, I got pushback on that every step of the way, every year, every time I made a film, every time I talked about it publicly. You know, there's this misconception that if we pay our participants that there, it, then suddenly the authenticity of the story is jeopardized. And that's, that, that's really ridiculous. <laughs> traditional documentary theory. Really it comes from, you know, documentary comes from like half sort of filmmaking practice and half of, 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 of journalism. And in journalism, that's like, you don't pay somebody for a story that you put in the newspaper. So there, there's a long tradition from the earliest days of documentary of like, no, we don't do that. There's a very distinct difference there. But documentary is, a, is, is evolving. It's an evolving form. I mean, it's not at all the same way it was in the 50s and beyond that. And, 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 and there's room for us. When you show this, at Sundance, was there discussion amongst the other documentary filmmakers that you just like hanging out at the bar, if one hangs out at a bar during COVID, um, and talk about like, what are the kind of conversations you have within the filmmaking community about this informally? About this topic? Yeah, not, no, not I, street, sitting around talking. I thought I would have a lot, and I actually included in our press notes my thoughts on this and why we did it. Um, and we paid everyone, right? And we paid everyone and, and if everyone got this credit. Um, and we paid people day rates. We paid people really well. And that was part of our fundraising and <laughs> why our budget was hard to raise. Um, and I thought, I thought I would get a lot of questions about it. I thought particularly the press would try to poke at me and try to poke at the validity of this film because of it. You're the first person to bring it up. <laughs> yep. Nobody's brought it up. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe everyone's ready to have this conversation now. No, I, I just think it's really fascinating. And, and, and as somebody who's teaching and teaching documentary practice, it's something I'll, I'll talk to my students about. And I'm sure people will have, you know, a different, different position. I teach in an art department, so it's not a communications department. A communications mm -hmm. department, they, they might have... Um, more uh, of an issue. Um, so the, um, 
one of the scenes that I thought was really most powerful was the one about Ace Ventura and, and throwing up. Mm. Um, and, you know, in trying to think about structuring the film, to me, there are many things that really hit you in a gut. Mm. But hearing, and I forgot who it was who was talking about it, about how this was their favorite film, it meant something important. And then they see that, and then how that effectively gets them. I mean, that's to me a critical moment in the film. And when you're thinking of structuring it, because the editing in this film is so critical. I mean, they're like getting all those pieces, putting them in there, find a sense of rhythm, where is it structure? And it works really nicely. So why did you decide to put that at that moment? And what was your thinking around that? I love that question. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the way we edited this film is we first had these pods, right? And if you, if you watch the film, you can kind of start to see those pods if, if you watched it a couple of times. Um, and a lot of them change over time. And, but, you know, the, that, the vomiting pod, <laughs> which we call <laughs> the, Ace, <laughs> the Ace Ventura pod, um, it wasn't always where it is. And it ended up in that place because uh, Caroline Nebresco, who you may know, she had been at Sundance for many years. She came on as one of our EPs last fall and she really helped me uh, in the story structure. And she just asked me at one point, she was like, okay, at one hour, that's where the climax of your film needs to be. What is, what is it? What is the climax of your film? What is that scene that really brings everyone in? And I immediately knew that it was that scene. So that, for me, it was like, we have this buildup where things just get worse and worse and worse. And there's that scene. And then we start to, things start to get a little easier and there's a little more breathing room in the film and we're seeing a little more nuance in the representation. So I just, so I'm so glad it works, right? That people seem to be having that response to that yeah. scene. That it, I, I think, I mean, all the film works well, but that particularly is, is a moment. Were there, were there other films that you were thinking of putting in? Um, and I was, even though it's not so much Hollywood, but Tangerine seemed to be that needed to be sort of commented on. And I don't know if I missed, did, did you have, um, oh, what's the name of that film where, um, uh, God, where they play, uh, Tony Curtis is dressed up as a woman playing in a band. Um, what's that? And Like It Hot. I'm like, and hot. like, yes, of course I know that film. And did I just miss that? Was I asleep at that moment? But that seems also to be sort of a very culturally significant one. And then I have to say, Bugs Bunny is like, when you think about cross-dressing in cinema, I don't think any character has more cross-dressed than Bugs Bunny. And, and yet the, the, there are many of them in there, but the one you picked on uh, what's opera doc, I think is particularly um, incredible. And I think in many ways, people will respond to that moment as an important moment as well. That's my favorite clip in the movie. That just it is endless joy I experience when I watch that clip. Um, for some like it hot, you know, it's certainly, people have asked me that and it, early on it was in our, in our database. But ultimately, you know, the way celluloid closet uses it, yes. uh, they have that last scene where no one's perfect. I mean, you can't top that. Like, I, I love the way they used it. And I just, I, if I was going to include it, I would have to include that scene because it's so important. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't want it. It just felt like a carbon copy. And I didn't want to do that. I felt like that wouldn't be respectful to the celluloid closet. Um, and, you know, we had so many other films that can kind of right, right. tag on to the other issues. Point, it's like the films you put in are ones that make a case about something or something that somebody talked about and meant something to them. I mean, in yeah. a sense, it's about what the characters were responding to less than so much than the points you wanted to make, I think. Absolutely. There were touchstones that, that we came up with beforehand in the research that, and then Laverne came in and, you know, we collaborated on certain touchstones that we really hoped we would get to, but we did want to lead with the anecdotes, with the personal stories. So we did want, we, we would see what would come out of these interviews and then build on that. Um, Tangerine, we do have a clip of Tangerine in the beginning. Oh. Um, and for films that didn't come up naturally in these, in the interviews, but right. we felt were important, and I felt that I could put them in responsibly without a critique, then I did. And so Tangerine is an example that I, I felt I could, get, I could put it in without having a nuanced conversation about it, 
and in the beginning of the film, there is a, a clip of Tangier. There was there was a point in the film where you're talking about many trans women. They have to go out, and 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 it just seemed like that was that was what that was at that moment. Um, when somebody wants to come in, um, so. Um, Guys, do, do any of you have any questions? I have more questions I can ask, but um, this There's is- questions in the chat box. Oh, there are questions in the chat box. Okay, Nate, do you want to read your question? Where is Nate? Is Nate here? There That's you are. really a question. I just had a few. I also like All About My Mother. That was one of the first films mm. that was LGBTQ theme that I yeah. started to see all that stuff uh, could be in films. Um, and then my other one was essentially everybody hates on <clears throat> D.W. Griffith, which is understandable. Uh, I just, I sort of recently found out about Elise Guy or Elise Guy Blanchet mm -hmm. who was a filmmaker yes. before Griffith and one of my students pointed it out recently. And I was like, oh yeah, of course we need to, and nobody, no other film professors talk about her. And so I just wanted to include that because it was, because you mentioned Griffith, of course. So maybe there's a great start. documentary about her now. Yes, there's yeah, on can, it's on Canopy. If yes. that's the one you're talking about, you should um, show that to your students. And and let me just say, in in, in I guess defending the undefendable, um, because I went to film school. I got my graduate degree at Columbia, an undergraduate degree at Temple University, and I and I watched films by white straight men, and that's what I'd watched, and that's what I learned. So when I'm teaching, I teach the films that I know. And, and, and you really have to, and I didn't know about any of those films until that documentary came out. And now I start to begin, and now I start to challenge all of the precepts. And, and it's like, I'm, I'm working on, you know, a list of, I had a list of a film, 100 films that film students should see. And then I started to build out to 150. Now it's a 200 because I'm trying to make the film, the list more diverse. And um, I'm trying to share it with other film teachers because I think that like changing the sense of the canon is really kind of important. And, 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 and just to sort of, again, defend the in, in defense, I, I, I truly despise what Griffith did, but what Griffith did for film language and, and, and how we understand and appreciate film is clearly important. But we don't have to show Birth of a Nation. There are many other films that can show what he did in terms of language uh, that really sort of do that. Or you can show that with a film that reclaims the image. And there are several people who've done sort of mashups that sort of talk about the images that are in there and put them in a different perspective. And that's Just another way to sort of deal with that. I, I hear you, I do, and I understand. And I I wonder though, because I've heard some people say that someone else might have come up with these ideas if it weren't for D.W. Griffith, right? And so when we look at early film, we could probably find another film early on that exemplifies, you know, the language, you know, that you're attributing to him without perpetuating the the racist ideologies that watching his work, you know puts into the world and right. Right. nobody really needs to see it anymore, right? We know it exists. I don't believe in you know, like burning it, but I'm not sure it needs to be in the, I don't think it needs to be in the canon. I don't think it needs to be taught. And if it is gonna be taught, it has to be taught with all this context, right? With all the detail and all the criticism. And I, I really do think that there is this work to be done in academia to create a new canon. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, like a great project for somebody to take on and, uh, and to find a way to like get connected to all these films so that it can be seen in the classrooms, but put into a kind of sense of, of context. So that means we wouldn't necessarily have that. Um, do you have any other questions from, from any of y'all? Um, usually people have lots of questions. Um, I could ask another one. Good. Uh, Sam, how do you, you, I mean, we kind of, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but how do you feel about if a straight cisgender man directs a movie with trans characters and, and I mean, in the uh, kind of along the lines of that, some, there's a question somewhere in there. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have complicated feelings. Um, I, I don't believe we should only make art 
about our own experiences and we don't want to live in that world right but i do believe the artist is responsible for the work they put into the world mm -hmm. i deeply believe that and we're responsible for how it affects other people and not everyone feels that way a lot of people think the artist is only responsible to their own vision um so if you know a, a cis white straight dude is really passionate about this trans story i you know i he has to do his homework and if he doesn't then shame on him and he should not have the privilege of telling someone else's story um that being said i also just you know we don't we live in a world where the power dynamic is such that trans people are disproportionately underemployed disproportionately lacking access to housing i mean we know the murder rates for trans black women are exorbitant you know that it's an epidemic of murder and so when we live in a world that exists in that power dynamic I, I i think trans people need to be given like to need to be at the center of telling their own stories um and if someone thinks they can do it better i think there's a problem right in, with that um and so when when we talk about and if that person this mythological white cis straight guy um you know, says, well, I'm hiring, you know, I'm bringing in a trans producer, or I have a trans editor, or a trans consultant, that, and you have to put the trans person in a position of power, right? And that is in the, in the creative decision making, and that is as a director. So well, I say, let's support trans people to tell their own stories until we see a shift in the power dynamics in the country. So talk about boys don't cry in that context. In, in the sense of a non-trans person telling that story? Yeah. Um, you know, I would rather talk about systems okay. than individual people. All right. Because <laughs> that was that was an, an, an interesting uh, part of the film. I, you, yeah, I think I, I make my views clear in the film, <laughs> um, but I don't want to demonize individuals. You know, um, I think the decisions made in that film were done for reasons I don't know. Um, I have my critique of it. Um, but I also was very careful to show that that film was very meaningful and important to a lot of people and positive for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to critique an individual. I'd rather talk about the film and the system. <laughs> well, one thing though, I thought about, uh, that you did point out to in, in that particular film too, was that, you know, there was a black person that was killed, <laughs> you know, as part of that whole story, but they were left out of the film. And so many times there's that minimization of something for people of color. And even yes. in whether it's the women's movement, the LBGTQ movement, everything. Um, yes. And that's always an issue. So I was glad to see that you brought that out, that you did, you know, mention that I think a couple of times in different ways. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's, it's I, you know, it's something very few people know and recognize and i think because i saw the documentary before i saw the movie you know i knew the details of, of the issue and so it's just mortified and again i think this is it's less about the individual director and it's more about how our society prioritizes stories and you can't there's not enough room you know for for that many marginalized people you have to pick um, and, you know, I think Teak really sums it up beautifully when he's saying, you know, you can't have a trans person, you can't have a black person. So what does that say about his black trans ass, you know, and I think <laughs> deep and it's like, it, there's no room for him to exist. It's, and it's very good. I mean, there are so many s snappy comments in the film and that's like one of them I thought was really, really, really great. Um, do you want to talk about like getting, I, I know that because of fair use, you're able to use an awful lot. Like this film could not have been made like 15 years ago when that material was not. But were there any that you had trouble like actually getting the print of? Because part of the problem is you have to like get a good copy of the material and sometimes that can be a challenge. Were there any other films that were sort of difficult? Yeah, my understanding of fair use is you, you have an argument uh, of why it falls into the fair use. You have uh, a lawyer watch the film and detail that argument for every single clip. Yes. And then when that lawyer does that, you can then get insurance. Yes. And then you can use it. You never ask the studio, so you're never asking for a print. Yeah. 
So yeah. this is all material we found on our own. Yeah, well, that's very good. And I think you had the, the Donaldson group do that and they're the best. Yes, they are the best. And they're such good people. I yeah. adore them. Uh, you know, they did a lot of the early research to make that stuff happen and they do it for the right reasons. Like yeah. they love to be able to take something and like, let's get this and use it. But they'll also tell you, you need to take two frames off of that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's good, but just a little bit less. And I think, you know, that would make it uh, so much better. Uh, Ruth, do you have any questions uh, for Sam here? Ruth, are you still here? Ah, you're just, you're calling me out there, Bart. Yes, <laughs> Ruth is yeah. coming, calling to us from Buffalo. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. And from jumped Buffalo. on from another, going webinar to webinar today. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I was just gonna, um, I, I missed, the, I don't, I don't feel qualified to ask any questions because I missed the first part of the, um, uh, your presentation. We just talked about you, Ruth. <laughs> and uh, no one even knows who I am, Bart. Um, but um, but anyway, I you know um, I I did just want to um, agree with you. First of all, um, thank you so much for making the film. Yes, thank um, you for making the film. Yeah, um, and it's so needed. And and I, you know, I think that um, whereas in the past. Um, those of us who are part of uh, members of marginalized communities, uh, we weren't in a position to be able to make the films. And so those films exist, you know, they're films that exist and some of them are terrible. And then some of them, there are, there are things that are really, um, you know, redeeming and interesting and worthy of, of study without traumatizing us and our students. Um, but, um, uh, but I think at, at this point in time, I mean, I really agree with you that, uh, we have to tell our own, we have to be given the power to tell our own stories. And, and I think that, um, and, you know, so your film is very unique. Um, I mean, you tackled so much in your film and, um, and, and I think that's another thing that we run into, those of us working um, from marginalized positions, is that, you know, when we're, when we're the first to make something, um, everyone expects us to do everything with our film. Um, and, uh, and so um, anyway, I mean, so I just wanted to extend my thanks and my congratulations. Um, and I also, um, in addition to, to being a filmmaker and teaching that, um, I also um, run the Women in Gender and Sexuality Studies uh, um, at, my, at Buffalo State where I teach. And, um, and so I'm always so grateful because I'm able to use films like yours uh, in the classroom as well. Thank so you. And it's especially that. good. It's especially wonderful when things are on Netflix because almost all of our students have Netflix. So, yeah. so yeah. we have access that way. And then I also run, um, I also run a screening series that's focused on diversity at Buffalo State. And because Netflix allows you to, to screen their films too, I'm able to get films like yours out to a wider audience as well. And, so. and a film like this really can open up the eyes to what is possible and doable. Mm. And I think Why do you say that? It's a very, very empowering thing to, to, to hear the people in your film talk about what these images meant to them mm -hmm. and then to string them together. And again, if you're like the only trans student in your school and you're watching this and you're feeling like, oh, there's more here. To, it sort of gives you confidence mm. to sort of take on those ideas rather than to try not to have the faith in yourself to move yourself forward. Because sometimes people are, if they're not given the right encouragement, will easily like try to emulate what other people are doing rather than to do the things they need to do. And I think this film gives people the encouragement 
just take that step forward and to do the thing they should do. That's a wonderful thing to hear. Thank you. So um, let me ask you this, because it's something you generally ask to people. Are, are there scenes that you took out that you wish you didn't have to take out? Are there sections in this film? Because I'm sure the first cut was like probably 30 minutes longer and uh, things you had to, uh, to, to trim out that just for flow or other reasons, just we're not, you're not able to sort of put in. We managed to have our final cut under two hours um, and our, our first cut was three hours. <laughs> it was much, much longer. Um, I mean, there's so many things we didn't get to include. I think I collected over 600 television titles and 400 film titles. Yeah. And there's so many people we didn't get to include. But there was one scene that really, I think, got cut at the very, very, very last minute because it was too long and we couldn't, it didn't have the same impact if we trimmed it down. And it was this scene that talked about this three episode arc in All in the Family, the Norman Lear television show yeah. from 1977. Yeah. And it's the scene of, uh, that includes this woman named Beverly LaSalle, who the show doesn't quite know is if she is trans, if she's a female impersonator, if she's drag, like they conflate all these ideas. Um, but ultimately she's killed. Uh, and she dies, and um, there was a conversation among our interviewees of how this show seemed to put the decision upon the the cis man. Um, what's the protagonist's name? Uh, Carol. Carol's Archie name. Archie Bunker. In the sh Archie. Archie Bunker. Right. He yeah. gets to decide whether her life is worth saving or not. Right. And That's the question in the so film. Great, right. Right. I feel like yes. And, well, we and have so, to you know, us now. That's yeah, like, right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I know. No, I couldn't have made that connection. Um, so, you know, the, this story seems it's like it shows the the love of Edith, right? And she's like the moral center of the show. You know, she's very religious, and she she loves Beverly and considers her sister and her friend. And when Beverly is killed, I, I, uh, Edith starts to question her faith. But, and so it's seen as this like really empathic storyline. But when you watch it through a trans lens, you're like, this is not only, okay, the trans person has to die in, in order to show someone else's empathy and how, they, how deep they are, but also the fact that the, this storyline opens up with Meathead asking Archie, you know, would you have saved her life if you knew she wasn't a woman? And so, um, it was a really impactful scene, um, but it took us too long to get to it. Mm. Mm. But Netflix asked me this question when they were doing promotion and they did a video um, incorporating that scene uh, and Laverne and I talking about it. So if you go on the Netflix uh, Instagram, you can okay. find us talking about the scene and we, we gave them the clips to, to put in. Uh, Kyle has a question here. Do you, wanna, do you wanna ask that Kyle? Or Kylie, excuse me. No, it's okay. No problem. No, I was just saying, I just wanted to thank you, Sam, for putting this together. I'm, um, I'm trans and like, I'm like super nervous talking right now. So um, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. And um, it means a lot to me and just really gives me hope for, you know, what I'm pursuing. And yeah, I just from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing yeah. that with me. It always, I, I love to be able to share this, this, these conversations with other trans people. So thank you. So, so Kylie, are, are, you're a film student. What, are yes. you working on a film now? You want to tell us what you're doing? I am. Um, I'm working on um, trying to get it all lined up, but um, it's about, it's the love story of uh, me and my partner and how um, me coming out to her and just how she was just, she had inclinations of what I was going to tell her, but when I finally did, it was just like so powerful. She, without dropping a beat, she's like, I, I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to tell me. And just, you know, I'm a hundred percent on board and I'm not going anywhere. So it's just basically me finally building up the courage to tell her the personal struggles to, you know, letting, finally realize, well, not finally, you know, accepting myself for who I am and then just finally getting the courage to, to tell her and, 
just the struggle to get there. So yeah, that's what I'm working on. It's going to be my senior, my senior project. So um, which I will love be that. next year. <laughs> I love that. We need more joy. We need more love mm -hmm. stories, right? Trans yeah. people need to see these possibilities, right? We, we, how do we know it's possible if we don't see it, right? Exactly. Uh, so please share that film with me when you're done. I would love yes, to see it. Absolutely. And if I can be of any use while you're making it, please let me know. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kylie, if you need me to look at a cut, um, I'm easily findable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I got this script pretty much where I want it to be. I have some adjustments I need to, to make. But um, yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about there. So now it's just moving it into the, the next phase. So. Well, Sam, I, unless anybody else has any other questions, anyone, anyone, I, I'm really so happy that A, you made the film, the film is so good and so impactful. I'm happy that Netflix picked it up so so many more people can see it and people can share it with each other. I, I think that also, um, I mean, this, I think this is the most visible film that treats the subjects as collaborators in a key way. And I think that that's a small thing, but it's visible and it's out there. And I think that's going to change the conversation for some people. And I think that's a really great thing. And I want to thank you for coming and hanging out with us for, for an hour. I mean, I'm sure that most of the Q and A's you do are like 10 or 15 minutes. And This um, was such a joy, Bart. Thank you so much for, I mean, you're, I, I wasn't, you know, I, it was very honest when I said these questions are great. I love this, I love this conversation and your reflections and the details you've noticed just mean so much to me. Um, and this, this was really a pleasure. It was really a joy to speak with you all.